Hello everybody, my name's Fred Watson, I'm Australia's astronomer at large and today I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt because that's where I'm supposed to be at the moment rather than here in Sydney. Never mind that, it doesn't stop me talking to you about Australian astronomy and the dark skies that we have here in the great southern continent. So this is all about uh, an overview of Australian astronomy, particularly with a view to dark skies. Uh, my job, as I said, is astronomer at large. I work for the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, which consists of 3,000 grown-ups and one astronomer. I also have a few university affiliations too. Astronomy in Australia goes back a very, very long way with Aboriginal people watching the skies as long as 65,000 years ago on this continent. And one of the beautiful uh, Aboriginal constellations is the Emu, which is a dark constellation in the Milky Way. In our modern view of the Emu, we see it like this, a lovely picture taken by uh, an Australian amateur astronomer. On the left is the Milky Way, uh, you might be able to make out the Southern Cross, but right next to it is the coal sack, which in the Aboriginal tradition is the head of the emu. Today we understand a lot more about these visions of the sky, and in particular, uh, the two Magellanic clouds are also present in our southern skies, uh, the two nearest dwarf galaxies of any size. Uh, they are visible very clearly on the right of this image. And here's another picture of the Milky Way with the iconic Southern Cross right in the middle of the picture and the head of the emu, the Colsac Nebula, right next to it. Of course, here in the south, the galactic center passes right overhead in our night sky. And this beautiful image, once again by a local amateur astronomer here in Australia, shows a lighthouse not very far from where I'm sitting now, which we hope will shortly be Australia, part of Australia's first urban dark sky park. Uh, but over, directly over the, over the top of it uh, is the centre of our galaxy, the galactic centre, perhaps the most interesting part of the whole sky. Also, we have the two brightest globular clusters in our southern sky. Uh, this is Omega Tauri, uh, the brightest, and this one is called 47 Takani, uh, a little bit fainter, but still really very easy to see, actually, with the naked eye. Uh, it, it's, it's quite obvious. So our vantage point on the universe here in the south has a number of key advantages. First of all, we have the latitude advantage. We see these important objects like the galactic center and the globular clusters, the Magellanic clouds. But we also have another one that's not so obvious and that's a longitude advantage because Australia sits between Southern Africa and South America. And so if there are uh, transient uh, phenomena going on in the universe that we want to observe, Australia fills the gap in uh, observing these phenomena very important. We also have stable atmospheric conditions, generally speaking. We have dark skies, as I'll mention in a minute, and we also have the most radio quiet radio astronomy site on the planet, and I'll talk about that too in a moment. Let me first take you, though, to this place. This is a mountaintop called Siding Spring, uh, and it is home to Siding Spring Observatory in the beautiful Warrumbungle mountain range in northwestern New South Wales. That dome, which is very large and seen here decorated with ribbons for, for its uh, 40th anniversary a few years ago, uh, that dome houses a telescope called the Anglo-Australian Telescope, the biggest visible light or optical telescope on Australian soil. As I mentioned before, it's actually now 46 years old, uh, but still going strong, still producing world class science with 30, 30.9 meter mirror and a lot of um, very important and very new astronomical instrumentation. Uh, that telescope was the first large telescope in the world when it was built to have computer control and uh, that's a picture of the control desk at that time. The com computer hardware has been updated quite a bit but the staff haven't, that's the same person. Uh, Robert Dean, one of our uh, key personnel, now retired actually, sitting at the control desk of the Anglo-Australian Telescope. So our dark sky project at Siding Spring has been to make sure that the dark skies have been protected by le legislation. Um, so you can't put floodlights in within certain distances of the observatory. In fact, it goes out to something like 200 uh, kilometers or about 120 miles 
uh, from the observatory side that you have to be careful what kind of lights you put in. And we also have worked on new Australian lighting standards. Those dark skies have let us uh, apply to the International Dark Sky Association to make the Warrumbungle National Park, which is right next to the observatory, and indeed the observatory is now part of this dark sky park, uh, to become the first Southern Hemisphere IDA dark sky park back in 2016. We were very happy for that to happen, and it's produced uh, great results as far as tourism is concerned. There are actually now two more uh, dark sky places in Australia, and we are hoping for more too, including that urban dark sky park I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. We work closely with the Australia, uh, Australasian Dark Sky Alliance, uh, which is an, advo an advocacy group for good lighting and dark skies over and above just what astronomers are interested in. It covers wildlife and uh, the ecology of the planet as well as human well-being. Our dark skies now extend uh, beyond the, the, um, the, the boundaries of Australia because Australian astronomers have access now uh, to telescopes overseas because of a strategic partnership forged between the Australian government and the European Southern Observatory uh, back in 2017 uh, to give Australian astronomers access to these absolutely world beating Southern Hemisphere telescopes in Northern Chile. This is the very large telescope the four enclosures of that instrument at a place called Cerro Paranal in Northern Chile. So Australian astronomers can use these facilities and eventually they will also be able to use this, which is the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is a multinational uh, project, including of course many partners within the United States, which is where it's led from. Uh, we currently have a 10% share in that instrument uh, when it is open for business uh, in the late 2020s. With, the, with its uh, seven uh, 8.4 meter diameter mirrors synthesizing a 23 meter diameter telescope. Colossal stuff and very much something that Australian astronomers are looking forward to. But it's not just in the optical region of the spectrum that we have world leading facilities because the world's biggest telescope and it is a radio array and will look a bit like this um, is being built partly on Australian soil. It's called the SKA and SKA stands for square kilometre array. That's because when it's finished the telescope will have a collecting area of one million square metres which is a square kilometre. So the square kilometre array, an um, international project involving many countries, uh, there will be telescopes, uh, array, the array of telescopes will be in Western Australia uh, and also in Southern Africa, as you can see on this map. Its headquarters are actually uh, in, near Manchester in the United Kingdom. But the SKA is a major project in which Australia is playing a very large part. It will be built, or the Australian component will be built, at a place called the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. It's in Western Australia, which is a very large state uh, with um, a very low population level in its interior. And so this is the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, and we are building um, what you might call pathfinder instruments to set up the square kilometer array itself which doesn't exist yet but is well on the way. Uh, the crucial thing is that this is actually, I've said it's the world's quietest radio astronomy site, that is probably not an exaggeration, there are others that are nearly as quiet but there are no mobile phones, no microwave ovens, nothing around here which can uh, radiate um, interference for the radio telescopes. It's dark skies but in a radio astronomy sense. Uh, it's also protected like Siding Spring Observatory by a 325 mile diameter radio quiet zone. That's the distance from New York to Toronto. So it's a big zone where you can't bring certain pieces of electronic equipment uh, to spoil the, observatory, uh, the observatory's work. Here we have a, an image of uh, ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, uh, which is 36 antennas like this, beautiful antennas, and you can see the frequency coverage there. Uh, I don't really need to go into the details, but I'd like to point out this instrument, which is a curious looking set of things like a, looks like somebody's left a whole bunch of coat hangers lying around. In fact, that is the, uh, another SKA precursor at Murchison. It is the Murchison Wide Field Array. Uh, 4,000 of these little dipole antennas, which uh, will, will where they're actually steered electronically. They are not 
uh, mechanically pointed like a, a radio telescope dish. Uh, so everything happens in solid state. There are no moving parts. An extraordinary instrument and the square kilometre array itself will be based on similar technology to this, only rather than looking like coat hangers, the antennas will look more like Christmas trees. Um, so what's it going to do? Well, uh, when it is built, the SKA will have more than 130,000 antennas and this incredible data rate, 10 times the global internet traffic altogether. That's phenomenal stuff. I can't remember the number of petabytes per second. That is, it is just colossal. And what the telescope will do is to explore, as I've said there, the whole history of the universe from the dark ages before the first stars lit up to today's galaxies, uh, like that beautiful artist's impression there, which I hope you can see uh, rotating uh, on the animation. It will also shed insights into some of the greatest mysteries that we face at the moment. One of them is the fast radio bursts, these pulses of radio radiation, uh, which are very brief, just a few milliseconds long. Uh, they are found all over the sky, and we really don't quite understand what they're all about and where they come from. But ASCAP, when it was uh, in its prototype stage a couple of years ago, uh, found 20 in its first year. So this is very important science and it's something that we will, uh, will play a, an important role in when the square kilometre array comes online late in the 2020s. If you want to know more about this kind of thing, um, forgive me for uh, putting in a plug, but why not? Uh, there's a book called Exploding Stars and Invisible Planets, The Science of What's Out There, uh, which has uh, was written by somebody with a very similar name to mine. Uh, um, it's uh, published by Columbia University Press. It came out in January. It's as up-to-date as I could possibly make it, but it talks a lot about uh, the, the effect of dark skies, both in visible light and in radio radiation. If you buy it in Australia or New Zealand, it's called Cosmic Chronicles, a user's guide to the universe. Same book. Don't buy them both. It's the same book. And finally, let me just add, um, the world of astrophysics, of course, is at the moment, uh, as, as everyone else is, is a kind of on hold for um, a, a return to normality once the COVID-19 crisis is over. But it doesn't stop astrophysicists from doing useful stuff. And actually, there is a group at Swinburne University, one of our universities here in Australia, who've been working with the health departments to make this symptom tracker. BeatCovid19Now.org is the website. The symptom tracker uses software developed for astrophysics in order to track uh, where these symptoms are occurring and perhaps allow the health departments to, 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 to locate um, clusters of the, of, uh, of the infection. So great stuff, astrophysicists helping with health. Sometimes astrophysicists get a little bit carried away with those activities and this poor chap who also works at Swinburne University uh, managed to get some magnets stuck up his nose while he was working on a coronavirus device. I take my hat off to him because that's the kind of pioneering work um, that, uh, that leads to great discoveries, even if it might be quite painful when you stick things up your nose. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my short talk. Um, I hope that's been useful. I hope it's whet your appetite to look further into our dark, dark skies here in Australia. And once again, thanks to the Department of Industry, Science and Energy and Resources for keeping me going. Good luck to you all. Many thanks.